Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you all here to our biannual Distinguished Speaker Series event for our Center for Leadership Studies. It's wonderful to be convened together in person, and I really look forward to hearing from today's distinguished speaker. A special welcome to our Center for Leadership Studies fellows. We have a group of fellows with us. If you could just raise your hand. Thank you for joining us, and congratulations on all the great work you've done so far. Uh, our speaker today has amazing leadership experience in corporate advocacy, social impact as a book author. She's going to be introduced to you in a few moments by one of our student fellows, uh, Zainab. And I just wanted to remind everyone about the purpose of our speaker series, which is a key component of our Center for Leadership Studies. Uh, the center was conceptualized and brought to life in 2019 by Prof Professor Butkus, whom we all know. And I'd like to thank Dr. Samar Issa, who is with us on Zoom. She couldn't be with us here in person today, but as of this fall, she is our new director of the Center for Leadership Studies. So thank you to Dr. Issa for all of your hard work in putting today's event together. Our series is designed to bring together leaders in business, military, law enforcement, sports, healthcare, government, international advocacy, and other professions to share their perspectives on leadership with our university community. Um, the center is also a vehicle for research and thought leadership, so some of our fellows are engaging in that uh, right now. Also to provide inspiration and examples of leadership to our student body and our student community. And we're very honored and pleased to have a truly amazing uh, female leader with us here today who embodies these values and inspires all of us to action. And now I'd like to turn it over to Zainab and Nasri, one of our Center for Leadership Studies fellows, to introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Zainab. Hello, everyone. Um, so we have here today Ms. Um, Salmi Abouhsen, which is the CEO of uh, Cape Blue Technologies and President S2 Associates International. Uh, she is a telecom infrastructure ex expert and innovator. Samia has a uh, build, has been building global telecommunication networks since the mid 1980s, doing business in Americas, Africa's, the Asia's, and um, the Oceania. Her role responsibilities have ranged from research and development at Gale Laboratories, uh, where she co-ranged from research and development and, pioneer and pioneered the first fiber optics broadband which is the DWDM system to cooperate executive functions, spanning all telecom lines and businesses. Samia has reconstructed and grown businesses in the telecom sector and served as a strategic advisor to Fortune 500 companies, governments, and the private sector. She served for three years as the ambassador to the Americas for the South Asia, Middle East, and the North Africa Telecommunications Council. Samia's entrepreneurial path started in 1997 um, when she founded Setwave Communications, a fiber optics advisory firm in fiber work, the first privately owned fiber optics testing company, which she then sold to Tyco um, Electronics in 2000 to form Tower Works, an ultra long haul fiber optics equipment and manufacturing firm. In 2003, Samia co founded um, S2 Associates International that provides telecom consulting services. Globally. In 2015, Samia also co founded Cape Loop Technologies, a telecom manufacturing firm, out of her passion and resolve to break down the digital isolation that excludes people from participating fully in the world economics by providing affordable broadband wireless access solutions. And as an immigrant um, and a naturalized citizen, a small business owner uh, in the high tech uh, sector, Samia joined the steering committee of the NJ Main Street Alliance in 2010 to promote policies for innovation, job creation, education, and the immigration reform. She is also the recipient of the 2013 David Zarnoff Award for Advocacy. She is currently a member of the New Jersey Pan-African Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Born and raised in Senegal, of Lebanese parents um, educated in Senegal, France, and the US. Uh, Samia was exposed at a young age to issues of gender, race, and religion. Um, together with Brenda Rosenberg, she created the Tectonic Leadership Center for Conflict and, uh, Transformation and Cross-Cultural Communication and co authored Harnessing the Power of Attention, um, a Multicultural and Multilingual 
Samia speaks Arabic, English, Farsi, Spanish, and Wolf. Uh, Samia has a graduate degree in electronic engineering and MBA from MIT Sloan School of Management. And she is a current resident of Asbury Park, New Jersey, in 2015, so a fellow New Jersey resident. Now, please help me welcome Ms. Samia Boyson. for inviting me to kick off this leadership series <laughs> on, Zoom. on Zoom over there. And I'm so sorry you're feeling so bad, and I hope you recover well. And I especially want to thank you. Do you all hear me? Yeah. Yes. Do you think I need to have this for the recording? Yes. Yes. Okay. I especially would like to thank you, the students, for being here today. And why thanking you? Because of your commitment to leadership. Because there are other programs on campus right now, I was told, and you chose to come here. So you chose dealing with tension today versus going into accounting. Good choice. And especially, one of the reasons I'm thanking you to be here today is because there is not much I can teach you on leadership. When I Googled a few days ago, there were like 57, 136 books on Amazon with a title, Leadership on them. There are about 1,236 books published in the 299th day of 2015, four books on leadership a day. So don't you think it would be very presumptuous of me to tell you anything about leadership? So I'm skipping the subject entirely. <laughs> and what I'm going to talk to you today is about tension. Why tension? I can, because I can predict with 100% certainty that Every, each and every one of you has gone through periods of tension, some more intense than other. Raise your hand if you've never experienced tension. Because I'll have you leave the room and go to the accounting. <laughs> because tension will never be eradicated. All you need to do is turn on the news, look at your Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Tension will never be eradicated. And more than that, Tension today travels as a speed of light. Because I build those fiber optic networks, trust me. It travels as a speed of light. When all that content comes in, it goes into a fiber optic cable and travels as a speed of light. And you know what? When it transmits, you have no control over it. But the only control you have over it is when you receive it and how you receive it. So tension is no longer a consequence of the information. Tension is information. And because it is information, tension has the power to transform you. And your relationship with tension will basically define and determine the type of leader you're going to be. So since we're in academia and since I'm really a nerd, we're going to go and have a quiz right now. We put some index card here. Are you feeling the tension of the quiz? Yeah? Okay, I won't grade you today, I promise. Maybe at the end of, of the lecture. So when you hear the word tension, what comes first to your mind? Don't overthink it. When you hear the word tension, what comes first to your mind? Anybody want to say something? First to your mind. What is it? Stress. 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 What else? Excellent. That's the physics part of it. So when you bend, it's compression the inverse is tension, right? So I'll show you. I have a slide on this later. <laughs> I told you I'm a nerd. And 
And the second question is, what is your immediate reaction to tension? When you're, go ahead. Stress. Stress, yeah? Eating. Eating. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. What else? Uh -huh. What is it again? Try to create peace. So she's halfway there through the program. Great. What's your name? Tony. Okay, that's it. So some people avoid it. So let me tell you where I was 14 years ago. When I used to hear the word tension, first I saw a color, red, even though it's one of my favorite colors. When I heard the word tension 14 years ago, I thought of war, injustice. And my first reaction to tension, that's because I don't run very fast, I do not avoid it. You can ask my husband. I actually like to get into it. And my first reaction to tension 14 years ago was making sure to find someone to blame and making sure they know I'm right. <laughs> By the way, that's still today. So, why 14 years ago? It's not a lesson, it's a little bit of a lesson in history here. 14 years ago, specifically on December 2008, December 27, 2008, the war in Gaza erupted. So for those of you who don't know where Gaza is, if you see here, this is the map of Israel, this is the West Bank, Palestinian, under the, uh, the Palestinian Authority. And Gaza is a strip. It's a strip 25 miles long. On its smaller part is under four miles. On its wider part is about seven miles. Gaza has a population of about two million people. So Gaza is about 1.5% the size of New Jersey with a quarter of its population. It's one of the most densely populated area. So 14 years ago, a war erupted in Gaza. And when the war erupted, a couple days later, a certain Brenda Rosenberg sends me an email. She goes, hello, Samia. My name is Brenda. Debbie Ford, Debbie Ford is, was our common teacher. So that's how she got my email. And she said, I'm really concerned about the deteriorating situation in Gaza. I'm very concerned, and I would like to have a conversation with you. Okay. So I mentioned that you're, uh, I had just graduated from an integrative coaching training program with the Ford Institute, that Debbie, and Debbie Ford was my teacher. And when I was in class, actually, Debbie used to say, you know, there, you, there is this person that is completely into fashion. She would come to class like completely dressed up and, you know, with a matching purse. And all of a sudden, she was really a fashion icon. And when 9-11 happened, she gave up a very thriving career in fashion and decided to take on interfaith dialogue. And Brenda called Debbie Ford and goes, Debbie, do you know of an Arab Muslim woman I can call that was trained by you? Debbie goes, yeah, one, <laughs> Samia. So needless to say, when I got the email, I was quite reluctant to actually even engage with Brenda. And one of the reasons is that you know, a few years back, I had actually participated in dialogue groups. And the first time any incident happened in the region, Anytime it exploded, we even had a cousin's club. But we were no longer cousins when the first war happened again in the region. So that group completely dissipated. And everybody, everybody went back into their element. But I have to also tell you a little bit more about Brenda. Actually, before I tell you about Brenda, when in 2000, what I mentioned is that on December, on, on the 27th of December 2008, Israel launched a massive attack on Gaza. And they called it Operation Cassid. And the Palestinian called it the Gaza Massacre. 
It left 1,400 people dead. 1,400 people and eight Israelis. 1,400 Palestinians and eight Israelis. And the reason that Israel decided to launch that war, because Gaza in 2007 was under the government of Hamas. So the Palestinian Authority had two parties. One is Hamas and one is Fatah. And Fatah controlled the West Bank, and Hamas was, uh, was elected at the end of 2006, and from 2007 started to, get, to control uh, the, the Gaza Strip. And Israel said, you know what, they're launching rockets into Israel, and we're going to launch a massive attack and end the rockets. And Gaza was destroyed. And I had received that email about a day or two after the war had erupted. But who is Brenda Rosenberg? So first of all, this is her website. I strongly recommend that you actually go and check her website. Brenda was a fashion is a designer. And she was a fashion executive. Brenda travels the world and takes amazing photos. And her photos are so good that she creates spaces everywhere in the in art galleries, in, in hotels. And her this is actually one of the photos that she had taken and transformed into a wallpaper into a bedroom. And Brenda lives in Bluefield Hills, Michigan. And she's on the news all the time. And she's also a peace. Actually, when 9-11 happened and she took on, she decided to create a program called Reuniting the Children of Abraham, the Interface Program. And she created a play, and about 2,000 people attended her play, and she was on the news for that. That's Brenda for you. What do we have in common? Brace yourself. So, didn't I tell you that Brenda is a fashion icon? So Brenda shops at Berg of Goodman. And Brenda wears Chanel. I shop at Costco. And I wear a curtain. Brenda, I told you, traveled the world putting murals together, uh, taking amazing pictures and, and have murals on, her, on everybody's wall. I traveled the world to, to put fiber optic system, either in the water or on land. So if you want to go on vacation, really go with Brenda. And if you want to go shopping, really go with Brenda. And here, Brenda gets on the news. She gets on the news because she invents, she designs clothes. And she's amazing. So she gets on the Miami Herald, on the New York Times Fashion Magazine. Well, I do get on the news. In the Nikkei Magazine in Japan, which is like you know an electronic magazine, and a physics magazine, where I predict the future of telecom networks. So again, if you want to be, you know, have a lot of fun, you know who to go to, right? And when she traveled the world, she was actually invited by King Hussein of Jordan for a conference in peace. What I do? I'm actually a real travel maker. I take the train, I go to Washington, D.C., I go to the Capitol, I meet with congressmen and senators, and I campaign for immigration reform, I campaign for minimum wage, all that stuff. I was actually invited to the White House because of the work I did on promoting healthcare reform in this country as well. So I do have a little bit my moment of fame. But I said Brenda and I are complete pairs of opposites. And last but not least, Brenda grew up in a secular Jewish household but is a practicing Jew. She's a practicing Jew from a secular Jewish household. I'm a secular Muslim that grew up in a practicing Muslim household, and they also sent me to Catholic school. So if you do have a crisis in identity, please go see Brenda. So our first phone call now, we're switching here. And there may be, you could be disturbed by the story, but brace yourself a little bit. 
So the war in Gaza now is raging, raging. Buildings are being destroyed. And on television, it was absolutely a horrific moment. And I get that phone call. Hi, Sonia. This is Brenda. Hi, Brenda. And we were really polite with each other. And the only reason I took it again is by respect for the before. But I had no interest in engaging on the conflict, especially while the war was raging. She said, well, I'm a Jewish Zionist that cares deeply about the Palestinian and Israeli, and I'm really horrified by what's going on in Gaza. The minute Brenda told me she's a Jewish Zionist, I saw the color of tension, red. I saw red. I didn't listen to anything else. And I was so angry. Because something Brenda didn't know. Brenda didn't know that at the age of 14, I used to launch campaign, anti-Zionist campaign, in my town in Senegal. Brenda didn't know that on campus, I would lead these anti-Israel movements. And what Brenda didn't know is in 1982, my grandmother and my grand aunt were burned to death by Israeli air raid on southern Lebanon. Brenda didn't know. And what Brenda didn't know is that in 2006, two years before that phone call, Brenda didn't know that my entire family had evacuated from southern Lebanon because of Israeli bombing on Lebanon. And what Brenda didn't know, my mom had Parkinson at the time, and by her evacuation, her situation really worsened. And what Brenda didn't know, that in 2006, I actually drove to Washington to pick up my aunt, my uncle, and their three kids. And they arrived with five duffel bags and a laptop because they had just evacuated from southern Lebanon. And what she didn't know that that uncle I was picking up in Washington, D.C., was a civil engineer in the city of Tyre that was under bombing where my family is from, and was seeing in front of his eyes the building he had built disintegrate. Brenda did not know. So you know what? You could tell the tension is even building now, right? I said, Brenda, why don't you Jews give up the Holocaust story? I dropped the bomb. And I was hoping she was going to hang up. I was actually hoping Brenda would hang up. But Brenda did not hang up. All I could hear is heavy, heavy breathing on the other one. Heavy breathing. It was like probably 30 seconds, 45 seconds. I don't know. It looked, it sounded like an eternity because I had like, I really wanted to hang up. And there was, you know, it, and our phone was on the landline, so I couldn't like blame, you know, the towers for going down. So what happened is she, and then I hear this voice, this somber voice. And Brenda goes, Samia, why would you ask me to give up the Holocaust story? I must admit, I felt shame at that moment. Because she actually, I realized she cared. I realized anyone else would have hung up. Anyone else would have gone on either on a rage or basically hung up and avoided the tension. But she did not. And she gave me that space. And that silence was a space that she gave me. And I explained to her. I explained to her, I said, Brenda, because my family suffered for the Holocaust that happened to the Jews that we were not responsible for. And they're still suffering from it. And then came the moment, and by the way, we're no Holocaust denier, I found out that my own family in Senegal took in refuge three, northern, uh, uh, three Jews from Northern Africa during the war. And, and I said, Brenda, yeah, that's true. Six million Jews died during the Holocaust. 
for something that we're not responsible for. And at that moment, what we call together is called the tectonic moment. At that moment, she and I connected. We connected to the horror of war, but we also connected to the tension. We deepened our understanding of each other. And we had this tectonic moment. And I said, Brenda, how can we use the Holocaust? How can we use a tension that separates us to find a way to unite us, to prevent future genocide instead of having the Holocaust use us? How can we use the past instead of the past using us? How can we use our pain to end conflict instead of having the pain use us to perpetrate conflict? And the reason I'm going to tell you, I'm telling you this story, even though you're far away from the conflict, and we're far away from, is because when Brenda, I asked Brenda, why really do you care? You're a Jew in very Red Sea, Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. She said, Samia, until I never feel safe as a Jew. So I understood that from her as well. And in this moment of tension, we were actually having a conversation because she didn't hang up. And we came up with this tectonic mantra. And the mantra is, how can we use tension to bridge our, our differences and connect our humanity instead of allowing tension to separate us? So together, we took that moment of intense tension. We took this horrible war. We took the story of the Holocaust and the story of my grandmother. Those are two truths that exist next to each other. We took these stories and we developed a program called Tectonic Leadership. And what I'm going to show you is a video of a retreat that we did at the Manresa Jesuit retreat of all places. And we had students from the University of Michigan, and we wanted to pilot this idea on how can you use tension instead of tension using you. How can you use tension as information? And when we were recruiting the students, the University of Michigan told us, oh, no, 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 I won't accept this guy. He's a troublemaker. Oh, he's a troublemaker. Bring him on. <laughs> and he was a troublemaker. But it was a five-day retreat, super intense. So I'm going to play the video for you. Um, okay. We can either learn to live together as okay. brothers and sisters, or perish okay, together sorry. as fools. Oh, Tectonic leadership is a vehicle for developing leaders from opposite sides of conflict to take joint ownership in transforming conflict, facing challenges together, finding solutions together. Tectonic leadership uses earth tectonics as a metaphor, recognizing that human interactions in situations of conflict are like fault lines between tectonic plates building friction at their boundaries, exploding, causing earthquakes, tsunamis, wars, and mass hysteria. Tectonic leadership redirects the energy, realigns the boundaries, giving the rocks back their elasticity. Tectonic leadership provides the tools, the structure, the discipline, and commitment to engage the other, together accessing the full potential of our humanity. Tectonic leadership is based on three disciplines and commitments. Tectonic leaders collaborate with people from opposite sides of conflict, taking joint ownership in transforming conflict. Tectonic leaders commit to expand their boundaries, creating a shared, congruent identity without changing their core beliefs. Tectonic leaders know that tension is seldom eradicated and do not avoid tension. Tectonic leaders use the tension surrounding conflict as an opportunity to deepen their understanding and engage the other. Tectonic leaders do not focus on advocating, defending, and serving only one side. 
Tectonic leaders commit to a level of integrity that cares equally about self and other, facing challenges together, finding solutions together. Tectonic leaders lead consciously through the lens of evolution, not the lens of survival. While survival makes common sense, it holds on to the footprint of the past. The instinct to survive separates us from the other and ultimately destroys us. The evolutionary mindset goes beyond common sense. It connects us to the other, fueled by the willingness to walk a path where there are no footprints. Tectonic leadership was created by Brenda Naomi Rosenberg, American Jewish activist and global fashion executive, and Samia Mustafa Basun, American Arab activist of Muslim descent and telecom executive. Two women who refuse to be enemies, fearless in addressing issues others refuse to talk about. Samya and Brenda engaged in a journey of unlikely partners, becoming relentless in their search for a course of action that would make a difference. Their commitment to collaborate and co-create a shared vision despite their polarized beliefs became an obsession. Brenda and Samya, no longer enemies, are now the living symbol of tectonic leadership, leaders shattering barriers, experiencing seismic shifts, creating a tipping point for peace, leaders who have expanded their boundaries without changing their core beliefs, leaders with a shared congruent identity. Samia Mustafa Basum, an American Arab Muslim woman, pro-Palestinian tectonic leader, and Brenda Naomi Rosenberg, an American Jewish Zionist woman, tectonic leader. The Tectonic Leadership Center for Conflict Transformation and Cross-Cultural Communication develops and trains existing of tension to create programs and we have taken these programs almost everywhere between police and community you know during the um, Floyd um, during George Floyd uh, uh, death and when there was a lot of this clash between police and communities from that point forward especially herself in the Detroit area she has engaged a lot of police and community together and we take it everywhere. And I want to tell you, I have taken it into my businesses. I have won deals. I have won contracts. I have won against my competition with inferior products because I knew how to use the tension created from competition to inform myself of my client. There is something, you need to be disciplined about the area of tension. This time, by the way, we're okay. okay. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. So, tectonic leaders pair for leadership. So, find someone on the opposite side. Because you know what? If you have someone who agrees with you all the time, that's common sense. And common sense is will not allow you to create really new solution together will not provide you additional information. We use tension as a connector and not a separator. We use tension as an opportunity to deepen our understanding, whether you're at work, whether you're at home, whether you're in your community, whether you're talking to your parents. When you feel tension, if you truly care, because you do need to care, if you truly care about the other, then listen to the tension. Listen to the information the tension is giving you. Listen to what they're trying to say. And tectonic leaders focus on creating solutions that benefit self and other. 
Because when you go, when you start deepening your understanding, it's no longer just about you and about the other. It's really about both of you and what comes bigger. I'm a scientist and I can give you tons of situation of tension during, um, you know, that led to superb innovations. Tension actually is a good thing. And I have learned through my career to develop a love relationship with tension. Every time I see it, I can innovate. Every time I see it, I learn more. Every time I see it, I expand my boundaries. When tension uses you, what do we do? We blame others. Nobody listens. It incites fear, and we perpetuate hate, tension, and conflict. We focus on finding the lowest common denominator. It doesn't do anything to you. I actually don't even believe in compromise. And what tension does when your attention is using you, you're trying to protect yourself. But when you protect yourself, you're actually not protecting yourself. Because it's only up to a certain point that you can protect yourself. There is no information in that. And it's very hard for, for many to, to comprehend. You really have to practice it. But when you use attention, you commit. You commit to hear the other. You ask permission to share somebody else's feeling. There is a level of respect. You deepen your understanding. And you lead from vision. You lead from vision of what can be, not from fear and survival. I can promise you, I've had a couple startups under my belt. I can promise you that if you are trying to survive, the odds that you're going to succeed are close to minimal. I'm not telling you not to survive, you know, the, if, if you're like in front of a train and you know, push back, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a sustainable way of being, a sustainable way of creating value. And we don't have enough time to go through that today. And, what's your name? Angelo. And Angelo talked about bending when he feels of tension because it's compression. You cannot build a bridge without tension. Hear me. You cannot build a bridge without tension. The only way a bridge is hold together because there are, there are cables under tension. And the minute you let go, the minute there is fear, the minute you put pressure on them, the minute you don't pay attention to them, the bridge collapses. So we have a few minutes now. Now is your turn. So we develop a four-step process. The first step of the process on how you can harness the power of tension. How can you use tension as element of power? How can you use tension to deepen your understanding? The first thing you need to do is you, need, you have to name the tensions and the party involved. I have the most difficult time teaching that part. The most diff people refuse to give it a name. In the case of Brenda and I, the name of the tension was the tension of the Holocaust, right? The Holocaust was for her never again. Never again will the Jews not have a safe place to be. The Holocaust for me is my grandmother dying for a fault of not her own. So that was a tension between us. Describe the tension on each side. Listen to the other. Describe the tension on each side. Harness the power of tension. Use tension to deepen your understanding and do not let tension use you to separate. Use tension to connect. And the fourth step is creating a tectonic commitment. Why a commitment? Because it requires some discipline, like when you commit to a relationship. You know, sometimes you say, oh, I want to give up. When you're in a marriage, trust me, I'm at my second marriage. Sometimes it doesn't look, like, look better than the first marriage. So when you're in a marriage and you're in a long-term relationship or in a short-term relationship and you just met someone and then you want to build that relationship, you need to commit to it. And what Brenda and I, they, we have committed and we have invested in each other 
And we have built what I call, by the investment, we have built a relational equity. Today, when I'm sitting in a room in southern Lebanon, and I hear anti-Semitic comment, I stand up and I challenge the people and I tell them you're anti-Semitic. And when Brenda is in an environment and she hears a group of Jews talking about Muslims or talking about Arabs in a condescending way and saying, you know, like they're the enemy, she stands up for Islamophobia. So if we have a little bit of time, if you want to use this index card, and if you have, you have a small situation of tension, write it down. And define who are the parties in that element of tension. Sorry. You have to be direct, honest, specific. And name the problem, not the solution. My MIT teacher told us a story one time in class, and he goes, his son came to him, and he goes, Dad, I need a new car. He goes, son, what's your problem? He said, Dad, I need a new car. He said, but what's your problem? He goes, my car is old. He said, well, your mother is old. <laughs> Does your car take you to point A or point B? Does your car need a new transmission? So often when we're defining the problem, and by the way, if one of you, you're in business school and you want to have a startup, the first thing when you have a good idea, an innovative idea, define the problem, not the solution. I made that mistake many times. I started a company because I had a solution to something and I forgot about the problem. And I spent money developing the solution to something that wasn't really the problem I was solving. Describe the situation on each side. Describe the situation from A's perspective and describe the situation from B's perspective. And name the feeling. Did that tension make you feel hurt, disappointed, frustrated, helpless, hopeless, uncomfortable, impatient, overwhelmed? And the intent is to develop a new relationship with tension, as I said. What could A say to be to recognize and validate what they feel? This is what we did, she and I. And I'm moving very fast through that because I'd like to take some questions. And then you have the commitment. And when you have a commitment, you take action steps. You develop a structure. I have a constant reminder in my mind that there is a Brenda Naomi Rosenberg who is Jewish in my head. A constant reminder every time I'm in a situation of conflict or I am in the Middle East and there is anti-Semitic comment. Constantly. And what is the alternative? Bertrand Russell, one of my favorite writers, says it. War does not determine who is right. It determines who is left. Thank you, and I'm going to start taking some questions. Any questions? That's an excellent question. So depending, for example, uh, one of the universities asked us to do something on sexual harassment because there was, there, there, were, there was sexual harassment on their campus and they had policies in place. And it turned out that despite the policies, the students were really confused about what to do and not to do. Girls and boys being together. So we, did, we picked up uh, the topic of sexual harassment and we did a workshop on that. It was actually pretty good. Um, and we make it fun also. So uh, sexual harassment is not fun, it's not what I intend to do. But what we do is that we put sitcoms and, and, and show, and then we start telling the students, and then the students open up and start sharing about what is it that they're feeling. Yes.
It's very hard to talk about it because of the feeling. You see, people have a really hard time saying, I feel. And there is a level of honesty, and there is a fear. But when you listen to the tension, I mean, when, when we had the retreat, some of the people exploded and left the room. We had the first way, the first thing we did, we put the movie to die in Jerusalem. And there, you know, and it was, it's a horrible story. And we showed them what could have happened if the mothers of the two, two kids that were killed did, you know, knew how to harness that power. I've, we've done some work uh, you know, with, with the movement Black Lives Matters. So I'm in Asbury Park, New Jersey. One of my good friends basically led that movement. But then we have police and community. So how do you do that? So when somebody tells you, you know, I mean, it's, it's all topics. It depends on every topic that you have on campus. And even in business, like you're, you're a business school, right? Even in business school, some people say, well, I don't have investor. Yeah, we, you, you can do it in every area. I'm not meeting my, uh, my commitment. I'm not meeting my target. I'm stressed about homework. I'm stressed about workload. Any question? Any other questions? Zainab. Yes. So we had also uh, Jews, Jewish students. So it was Jewish, Christian, and Muslim. The kids that you saw here, you could probably can tell who is what, but it's Jewish, uh, Muslim, and Christian that were in there. And we had them play. There were skits. It all depends on the length of the program and what the topic is. You want? Like we spoke about, we did a workshop on BDS, you know, diversity and sanction, boycott diversity and sanction. Some, some students were leading that on campus. Anything, is there any area of tension that you say, okay, how would you deal with this? Yes. Thank you for that question, because we get asked a lot. So when you're compromising, when you're in a situation of compromise, what you're trying to do, you're trying to deny the other what they're feeling. That there is a denial in compromise. Lawyers do that because they want to settle. They really do. Compromise is the lowest common denominator. Basically, you know what? You give up this, I give up that. It's needed sometimes. You hear it a lot in politics, right? But how about, tell me what you need. Because in compromise is what you want, what I want, and the compromise is, okay, we'll settle at the middle, I'll take a little bit of what you want, and I'll take a little bit of what I want. But we're not talking about want, we're talking about need. What is it that you need? When somebody is arguing with you, when somebody is angry at you, stop for a second, listen to it, listen to it, and ask them, what is it that you need? And you will see, and when they hear what you need, and then you tell them what you need. And then you, you can also tell them what you're willing to accept and not accept, that's called setting boundaries, healthy boundaries, but from a place of commitment, from a place of care. You're not doing it from a place of destroying the other. And you will find out that it is amazing because together you can come up with a solution that you didn't even think about. Did I answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Anything else, please? What's your name? Edward, hi.
So what you're saying, for example, because I'm from the Middle East and because Brenda was attached to this, we needed to find a third party to actually tell the students about. Yeah. Um, so we, so for example, I'm obviously not black, but when we conduct the workshop about police and community, especially with the black and brown community, it's, we always have an African American partner with us. Because you, you don't have to, when people start to know you, you don't have to. But I think it's a lot better. So to answer your question, the answer is really no. It doesn't matter. Because the process is to truly identify the tension between the group. Now what we do when we don't know the issue, when we really don't understand the issue, we research it. We interview some people. We ask the people that are bringing us on campus, for example, what is the issue? You always have, have to name the problem. So once you name the problem, I don't do the work, you do the work. But third party would work, you can train anybody to do this actually. There is a really, uh, you know, we have quite a few pro uh, processes, please. Thank you for your question. Anyone else? Well, thank you. We, we spoke about it, right now we don't, okay? We have trained a few people, some of the students were trained. The students that you saw on the video used to not talk to each other. Now some of them actually have gone on to become lawyers and so on, and they support each other. So we have trained a couple people, but we, we haven't actually, you know, done it in a systemic way. Is everybody feeling okay or are you feeling an attention? <laughs> well, thank you. Anything else? Good. Thank you.